Well, children, I'm sure this has never happened to you before, but have you ever been in a disagreement with someone? Like, a br- you have? I thought it was just me. Oh, no. Yeah, we get in disagreements with people sometimes, don't we? Sometimes we get in fights with our brothers and sisters. Sometimes people steal our toys. Sometimes people at school are mean to us or people on the, on the road outside our house are mean to us. And then our parents come along, let's imagine, to a brother and a sister, and they've been in, in a fight with one another. And mum comes along and she says, what, you need to... Yep, but what about to the other person? What do you need to do? You need to say sorry. That's right. And then it goes like this, doesn't it? So let's pretend that the brother's hit his sister. And so mum says to the brother, you need to say sorry to your sister. And so he goes, I'm so sorry. I feel so bad that I was so mean to you and I'm never going to do it again. Most of the time it doesn't, does it? Normally it's like, sorry. It's like, oh, do I have to say, oh, sorry. And you're only really saying sorry because mum told you to, right? You don't actually feel sorry. And so what happens is five minutes later, the same brother and sister get in another fight again because they haven't been what we called restored or reconciled to one another. They're not really at peace. Mum sort of intervened and stopped it but they're kind of still at war with one another. And, and when we don't have true reconciliation, true restoration, what happens is we just kind of hold the problems for later. We delay the issues to later on. I know it's exciting, Asha. Shh, good boy. And, and so what we need is someone who can come and bring peace between people. And in today's Bible story, we're going to be looking at a story where something like that happens. And we're going to see David and his son, who are at war with one another, kind of getting peace together. And we'll have to watch and see, because there's something a little bit weird in the passage. And you'll see if you can figure out the weird thing that's in the passage. And you can come and tell me later on. But before we get to there, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the God who restores people together. And we do confess, Lord, that often we don't really want to be restored and we kind of just want to pretend to say sorry and walk away. And we pray that you would help these children to embrace the reality of truly being sorry and seeking forgiveness. Help us as parents to model that for them and to show them what that looks like. And help, Lord, Christ to be so glorious in our heart that we would long for peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're turning back to the book of Samuel. For those who are visitors here, we were working our way through Samuel, first and second Samuel. Over the last couple of years, and we took a bit of a hiatus while I was on holiday, and then the Jeffs helpfully took us through Peter, and now we find ourselves back here again after Easter, and we're picking up in the story where we sort of finished off in 2 Samuel 13, and we're going to read from verse 37 of chapter 13, and then in through chapter 14 to the end. So that was 2 Samuel chapter 13. 13, picking up at verse 37. And this is God's holy and infallible and perfect word for you today. Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Gesher. And David mourned for his son day after day. Just as a side note, if you're wondering who King of Geshur is, it's Absalom's grandfather on his mother's side. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. Now, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart went out to Absalom. 
And Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but behave like a woman who has been mourning many days for the dead. Go to the, to the king and speak thus to him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman of Tekoa came to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and paid homage and said, Save me, O king. And the king said to her, What is your trouble? She answered, Alas, I am a widow. My husband is dead. And your servant had two sons, and they quarreled with one another in the field. There was no one to separate them, and one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole clan has risen against your servant, and they say, Give up the man who struck his brother, that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. And so they would destroy the heir also. Thus they would quench my coal that is left and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, On me be the guilt, my lord the king. And on my father's house, let the king and his throne be guiltless. The king said, If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall never touch you again. Then she said, Please, let, let the king invoke the Lord your God, that the avenger of blood kill no more, and my son be not destroyed. He said, As the Lord lives. Not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Please, let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. He said, Speak. And the woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself, inasmuch as the king does not bring his banished one home again. We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God will not take away life, and he devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. But I have come to say this to my Lord, that the king, to my Lord the king, because the people have made me afraid. And your servant thought, I will speak to the king. It may be the king will perform the request of his servant, for the king will hear and deliver his servant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the heritage of God. And your servant thought, the word of my lord the king will set me at rest, for my lord the king is like the angel of God to discern good and evil. The Lord your God be with you. Then the king answered the woman, do not hide from me anything I ask you. And the woman said, Let my lord the king speak. The king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman answered and said, As surely as you live, my lord the king, one cannot turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has said. It was your servant Joab who commanded me. It was he who put these words in the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my Lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. Then the king said to Joab, Behold, now I grant this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now, in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. 
From the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for, it, for at the end of every year he used to cut it when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels, by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. And he sent a second time, but Joab would not come to him. Then he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and went to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered, Behold, I sent word to you. Come here that I may send you to the king to ask, Why have I come from Gesher? It would be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me go into the presence of the king. And if there is guilt in me, let him put me to death. Then Joab went and told him, went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his word to us. And before we consider it, let us come to him in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us your word. That you have not left us without a guide. That Lord, your word shines forth with the same splendor as when it was spoken by the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself, that your Holy Spirit takes it and illuminates it to us. And we ask that you would do that, that your spirit would attend to the preaching of your word, that, Lord, we might know the nearness of your presence in the preaching of the word of God and Christ might be glorified in it. Help us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the <clears throat> unique privileges of being an elder or a gospel minister is doing the work of the Ministry of Reconciliation coming alongside people who are at odds with one another, who are at war with one another, and restoring them together, bringing peace where there formerly was no peace. It's a, it's a great privilege to be able to sit there. It's not easy, but it's a privilege to be able to sit there and, and witness when people truly do come together, when there is real, abundantly rich reconciliation and restoration between brothers and sisters friends and family, parents and children. I can vividly recall moments in my life when I have had the joy of doing that, of seeing people embrace one another and, and seeing moments of war become wonderful stories in their life that they look back on as something that actually built them up in their relationship in the end rather than destroying their relationship. And maybe some of you have experienced that, maybe you've witnessed that, maybe you've heard that. Restoration is a beautiful thing, isn't it? It is a beautiful thing. And in this story, we have the joy of seeing a father and a son restored to one another. But to understand the weight of that, we have to put it in its context, especially because it's been a while since we were in Samuel, we remember that the, the story of David, as I've said before, is a little bit like a mountain. It goes up really, really well and then kind of just crashes. And the crash is all related to the story of David and Bathsheba in chapter 11. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story. Uh, David's adultery, David's killing of Uriah. 
and then God's judgment on him in chapter 12. And one of the judgments was that he would raise up a sword from within his own house and one of his own sons would bring the judgment and discipline of God upon David. And yet he experienced forgiveness And yet he experienced God's grace and mercy and love and was restored to fellowship with his God. However, the the child that would be raised up would be Absalom. And so then we saw in chapter 13 that horrendous story of Amnon and Tamar, which is grim to read through, let alone to preach through. And we saw that through the events of Amnon's actions, Absalom kills Amnon and becomes an outcast. He flees for his life, which we read in our section. He flees to his grandfather, Talmai, and hides himself away in safety. And you can imagine David would have been pretty frustrated, uh, pretty angry. Talk about a relational breakdown, right? It's one thing having an argument over who spilt the milk. It's another thing having an argument over who killed your son. And Amnon was David's heir. So the heir of the kingdom is now dead. And it's my other son's fault. And what makes this more challenging is at this point, Chiliab, the second in line, is gone. He's assumed dead as well, maybe in war, who knows. And so now Absalom's the heir. And so you can imagine the difficulty for David, right? My remaining heir has fled. And after all, he is pretty handsome like his father. And eventually, the days of mourning pass, right? We're told that he became comforted about Amnon. He had sufficiently grieved. And so he he reaches out in his heart for for his son Absalom doesn't he? It, it tells us that in verse 38, sorry, verse 39, the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom. And in chapter 14, verse 1, the king's heart went out to Absalom. And, and so the pathway of restoration begins. Eventually, Joab clues on to it. And it's a glorious story. Just observe the amazing story of this reconciliation. Joab can, whether he senses it, whether he hears David talking, he knows his king very well, doesn't he? So he very quickly picks up that there's something wrong, that his son doesn't, his, sorry, his king doesn't want to put his son to death, but his king actually wants to embrace the son again. He wants him back at his side. He wants his ear back. And all of you parents can understand that, right? It doesn't matter how wayward a child is. You still long to have them home. You still long to gather them in your arms. It doesn't matter what a child does to you. I can think of one elderly grandparent that I know whose whose son, when he was a boy, committed three or four crimes and ended up in prison several times. And yet, she never stopped loving him. She always longed for him to be with her, to be in a healthy, good relationship. And so Joab picks up on the heart of the king and he thinks to himself, what we really need is a mediator, right? We need an intercessor. We need someone who can come in here and bring these two men back together. And Joab kind of sees himself as that, but he knows that he himself, if he was just to ask, he wouldn't get the job done. He he needs an outsider. He needs someone different. He needs a wise woman. He knows that David has a soft spot for widows. He's seen David succumb to the wishes of a woman in the past. Remember Abigail, when she comes out to David and pleads with Abigail not to kill the fool, Nabal. And so he's seen that and he thinks, well, David's job is to care for widows. So an old widow should have a good inroad at working in this situation. And so he goes out and finds this wise woman. We've got no idea what her name is. All we know is she comes from Tekoa. And so here is this wise woman. She comes in to David and she's got a parable. It's very clever. 
I mean, the parable itself is reasonably clever, but the using of a parable is very clever. I wonder if you pick up why. Well, it was just a few chapters ago that a man came to David and said, let me tell you a parable. There was a man who owned a sheep. Do you remember the parable of Nathan to David that convicts him of his sin? And that Nathan brings home that cutting word when he says, behold, thou art the man. You see, what, what would have begun ticking over in David's mind when, when the woman came in and said, oh, I've got a situation here. I've got a story. I've got a problem. He uses a story, a very powerful story to get across the point and tells the story, a story very reminiscent, by the way, of Cain and Abel. You remember Cain and Abel? There's two sons in a field. One son kills the other son. There's blood guilt like there is in this story. And what does God do in Cain and Abel's story? Do you remember? He doesn't kill Cain. He spares his life, but sends him away. You see the, you see the similarities here. And so this woman comes and uses a story which would remind David of the Old Testament narrative, and also that would play on his role as a job to protect widows because she says to him, look, look, I, I have no one else. If, if they take my son away, the lamp of my husband will be snuffed out. The coal of my husband will be snuffed out. There'll be no name for my husband any longer. And who will look after me? And needless to say, it works pretty well, right? D David hears her problem, and like a good king, he defends the widow, which was the job of the king. And he comes to her, and he says to her, effectively, look, I'll look into it. You will be safe. I will send out some words. And, and she appeals with him more voraciously. The woman says, on me be the guilt, my lord, the king. And on my father's house, let the king and his throne be guiltless. And then the king, by oath, says, if anyone says anything to you, bring him to me. And hear these words, he shall never touch you again. You get the implication, right? If someone threatens you and your son, I will deal with them. He promises to defend this widow and her child. But then comes the behold the man, right? She says to him in a nutshell, David, you convict yourself, O Lord the King. Let me speak a word. Do you not realize that in saying this judgment, in making this judgment, you convict yourself because you have not done this? You have an estranged son. But notice how she paints it. She doesn't say, David, you didn't bring Absalom back. Look at what she says in verse 13. Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? David, how could you do this to God's people? We need an heir, right? You, you've not restored the heir of God's people to us, the next king of God. For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself inasmuch as the king does not bring his banished one home again. We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again, but God will not take away life. See, she appeals to God, right? God provides a way out like he did to Cain. And he divines, devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. She adds a bit of flattery, calling him an angel of God. And it all works together, doesn't it? Of course, David's not daft. And so he says to the woman, surely David, you know, Joab's behind this, right? I mean, random woman from Tekoa just turns up and knows my life story and knows what needs to happen. And, and, and what does he do? It's beautiful, isn't it? Joab, go and get my son. Go and get my son. And so out Joab goes, and he goes and gets the son. 
And whether the message comes at the time or the message comes later on, the king said, let him dwell apart in his own house. So the son gets back into Jerusalem, but he's sort of in his house in Jerusalem. He doesn't get to come into the house of David. He doesn't get to come into the palace, into the courts. He's separated still. There's still a division, right? There's not full restoration. There's not full reconciliation. David can't quite bring himself to do that yet. There's a half reconciliation. And so Absalom has to do the final step, right? Absalom knows how to get the job done. He calls out to Joab and Joab refuses to come, probably because he knows what Absalom's going to ask and it's going to put him in an awkward situation because his king has told him that Absalom is not to come into his presence. But there's nothing like burning someone's crops in order to get their attention. And so Joab lights a fire to their field. And sure enough, Joab's like, why on earth are you burning my field? And providentially, Joab is brought into the presence of Absalom. And Absalom uh, says the words in verse 32, let me go into the presence of the king. And if there is guilt in me, let him put me to death. In other words, I've, I've been restored to here. Why did you bring me back here if I'm not going to be in the presence of my father and my king? We're wasting our time. Either restore me fully to my father or send me away or put me to death. Either way, but let's not, wait, let's not beat around the bush. We want full reconciliation and full restoration. And then we get that beautiful picture right at the very end, right at the very end of the chapter when Absalom comes in. And I wonder if you can just just close your eyes and picture the scene. David's on the throne. The doors open up. Joab walks in with Absalom. And Absalom walks up. And, and prostrates himself, bows himself, lowers himself down before his father in submission and in humility before his father, before his dad, before his king. And, and the king does what? Hops up off his throne, walks down the stairs, takes his son by the face and lifts it up and kisses him. Isn't it beautiful? I mean, if, surely there must have been tears in the eyes of the bystanders. You know, can you imagine Absalom's mother, Makar, standing there on the side and watching her husband and her son embrace one another in this way? It's a beautiful picture of restoration and reconciliation, right? However, there's just something a little bit off about the passage, isn't there? I wonder if you sensed it. I wonder if when we read it, there was just something not quite right. It's all just a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, just, just stop and think about it for a second. David longs for his son, but does nothing. David longs to go out and restore his son. But Joab, rather than just talking to his king, has to go out and find this woman to bring her in and make up an enormous story in order to try and convince David. And the woman has to drive so hard that she's effectively strong-arming David into doing it. And, and even when David's convinced, he doesn't bring his son all the way back in, but he, he keeps him at arm's length. And it's not until Absalom burns someone's field down that David finally sees his son face to face. Doesn't it all just seem a bit off? I mean, yes, we start with separation and at the end they're together, why is it that the author is painting this picture? What is the author trying to highlight for us? Well, what the author's highlighting for us is, 
is understood when we comprehend why David, why David is struggling so much. Why is David struggling to bring his son home? The reason he's struggling is that he's wrestling with two realities. He's wrestling with, firstly, his duty as a king to uphold justice. And secondly, his duty as a father to love his child. Or to put it a different way, he's struggling with justice versus his feelings. You see, David knew that as the king... His job was to administer with justice. In fact, we're told back in chapter, I think it's 11, that David ruled and administered justice in the kingdom. And so now he's sitting here and he's like, well, justice requires that my son be put to death. Because he didn't accidentally kill someone. He murdered someone in cold blood. And he murdered his own brother in cold blood. He is deserving of death. And David's job as the king was to administer that justice. But something stopped him. His love for Absalom, right? And this is why, this is one of the reasons why the author, I think, puts in verse 25 to 27. Why is it that in the middle of the story, we all of a sudden get this description of Absalom being beautiful? Well, you've got got to remember, when was the last time David looked out and saw a beautiful person? It was Bathsheba, right? And it got him in a whole lot of trouble. The author says, guess what? Absalom was beautiful too. David had a taste for beautiful things. Absalom is described like Saul as the king that everyone would truly want. And so if you're a father looking for a son to take over your kingdom, what better man is there? What better son is there for me than this child? And if I put him to death, we get left with whoever's after Absalom, Ahimelech or Adonijah, I can't remember. And no one particularly likes that guy anyway, but Absalom, everyone loves Absalom. He's strong, he's handsome, he's got beautiful flowing hair, he's pretty heavy apparently. And so David is wrestling in this internal reality between justice and the parental love of a father to a child. I mean, dads, it just... Put yourself in his shoes. We're not talking about your standard methods of discipline, right? Can you imagine being in that situation? Uh, It's very easy for us to sit here in 2023 and say, well, David should have, you know, stoned him. But can you imagine actually doing that as a father? You see, and and when we get to the... when we get to this tension, all of a sudden we discover that this story is not here to show us a beautiful reconciliation and restoration. It's actually here to show us how to fail at restoration. Because we know the story of Absalom, right? This evening we're looking at the conspiracy of Absalom. This restoration abysmally fails. Why? What's missing? What's missing that makes it so that these people cannot truly be restored together? The thing that is missing is satisfaction. Not in the way we use it today, but satisfaction of the justice and wrath of God. It's like we sung in In Christ Alone, right? The wrath of God has been satisfied. Why? Because sin must be punished. And what's really interesting is when you take the story and bring it to the New Testament and bring it to Jesus Christ, you actually find a parable that sounds a whole lot like this story. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? 
I mean, you know the plot, right? Father and two sons. One son sins. And in his sin, he ends up separated from his father. And while he's away in a land far, far away, he longs to come back because of his hunger. And he comes back into his father. And as he comes back in, the, the father's longing for his return, we're told, right? So the father's standing there and he's looking out the gate, wondering when his son will come home. And then one day the son comes. And do you remember the thought process that the son has on the way back? When I get back, I'm not worthy to be a son, but I'm just going to ask my dad if I can be one of his servants because his servants get fed pretty well. And that's completely fine. And so he comes and he falls down before his father and he says to his father, look, and he doesn't even get to finish his sentence, does he? And the father does what? He grabs the man and he picks him up and it says, and he kisses his son. And he puts a ring on his finger and he puts a new robe upon him. And what does he declare? See, here's the key. They don't just go inside straight away. Do you remember what he says? Let us kill the fattened calf. You see, and, and there you see this, this little imagery of what is necessary for people to be reconciled to God. There must be satisfaction, brothers and sisters. Sin must be atoned for. You know, there's, there's a whole group of people in, in the Christian theological world who argue for what's called a non-violent atonement theory, which means basically God just says, you know what? I, I love you and I want you to love me, so I'm just going to make your sin go away. But I don't need to punish Jesus for it. Jesus dies because men are evil and he's an example, and he's a whole bunch of other things. But what he's definitely not is a sacrifice for sin. Well, the problem with that then is our sin remains, and you're stuck in the situation of David where you want to be reconciled to someone, but you can't. You see, God cannot be reconciled to man while they have sin. You cannot be reconciled to God while you remain in your sin. It is impossible because God's only means of communication and communion with you as a sinner is wrath and anger because of your sin. And so a offering of a satisfaction is required and God provides it, right? Like, like the father who says, let us kill the fanned calf. The father in heaven says, let us kill the son. Let us kill Jesus Christ. Let us put him to death as a sacrifice so that this prodigal son might come home. You realize this is what the Father has done for you. While you were estranged, remember what Paul says in Romans 5, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Not while we were at peace with him. Not while we were friendly. Not while we liked him, but we just couldn't get across the line. But while we hated him, while we were weak, while we were godless, Christ died that we might have peace. And if we have peace in his death, Paul says, how much more are we reconciled to him in his life? And like Paul says in Ephesians 2, remember, by his blood, we have been reconciled to God. We have been made at peace with God. And if you're sitting here today and, and maybe you've had a rough week, maybe you're an unbeliever, but maybe you're a believer who's got a guilty conscience and you're thinking to yourself, oh, Oh, God must be so angry with me. God must hate me. I did it again. I keep telling him I won't do it again, but I did it again. My sin returned. I looked at what I shouldn't look. I touched at what I shouldn't touch. I didn't do what I should have done. I'm a mess. Maybe you're sitting there like that today. Oh, the Father says to you, I have sacrificed my son. 
I have satisfied the wrath of God so that you might have peace with me. Don't you long for peace? For a clean heart? Aren't our hearts so often just weighed down under our sin? And the devil comes and whispers in our ears, Oh, don't forget. We all know what you did yesterday. Everyone knows you gossip. Everyone knows you murmur and complain. Everyone knows that you're grumpy. Everyone knows the state of your pathetic life. God could never love you. And the Father points to the cross and says, In this way, I have loved you. Peace, brothers and sisters, peace with God, but also peace with man, right? You see, there's no way of having true peace with one another without the intercess intercession of Christ. You see, the reason these two men can't come together is because there's sin in the way. But when two people have their sin removed by Christ, then God can work reconciliation in the hearts of the people before us. This is the hope we go with into reconciliation, into restoration. I can never forget when we in one of our courts was talking about, this was quite a while ago, talking about a situation where two people needed to be reconciled together and, and it, was, it had been going on for yonks and yonks and yonks and someone said, it's just like, it can't happen, it's too hard, it's, like, they're just, it's just no possibility. And someone in the room said, we believe in the gospel. And so it's possible, right? And so if you're at odds with anyone, you know, if there's a family member or a friend or God forbid someone in this church and you have an issue with them, do you know the blood of Christ will overcome that and bring peace horizontally between one another? And if any of you have an issue with me or, or with anyone else in this room, you go to them and you say to them, I want to be at peace. Can we have peace? You know, there's that telling scene in, in Lord of the Rings when Saruman says, to the men on the ground and the king of Rohan, can we have peace? And the king says, we'll have peace when you hang upon a gibbet for your crows. Someone has hung upon a tree so that we may have peace. What a glorious thing it is to be a Christian, right? Oh, what a privilege. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have laid down a sacrifice that we might have peace with God and peace with one another. Lord, we ask, do the work of restoration in our lives, reconcile ourselves to you and then to one another. Lord, we thank you for this peace that we have in Christ. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to work this out in us. Give us great assurance and confidence, comfort in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to be ministers of reconciliation wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.